Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. My guest today is Kara Golden. She's the founder and CEO of, the, of Hint Water. It's a fruit-flavored water. It was founded in 2005 and dubbed the official drink of Silicon Valley uh, because it was stocked at the offices of Google and other tech companies. Now it is available in more than 30,000 stores nationwide, and sales have, have actually doubled uh, during the course of the pandemic over the past year. Kara, uh, welcome to, to How I Built This Resilience. Thank you. Excited um, to be here. Excited to have you. And before we get into it, uh, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, however you're watching, please submit your questions for Kara. If you have questions about the beverage industry, about running a beverage company in the midst of a pandemic, we were just talking about this before we went live, um, how you reintegrate people back into an office, which I do want to talk about with you, Kara. Um, please do submit those questions and we will get to as many of them as possible. So Kara, before we um, get into it, um, tell me a little bit about just the idea for Hint. Because um, this really, I mean, now, of course, there are tons of, you know, of, of these kinds of drinks, but you were one of the first kind, kind, sort of flavored water drinks. Tell me uh, how, how you had the idea. Yeah. So not one of the first flavored waters, but one of the first unsweetened flavored water and actually the first unsweetened flavored water. So I was a tech executive. I was not a beverage executive. I have never worked in the beverage industry outside of Hint. And when I left my role at America Online, I was running their e-commerce and shopping partnerships. And when I left that role, that's when I started looking at my own health. And I was trying to get healthy. I had a bunch of kids. I had three kids under the age of four at the time, and I couldn't lose the weight. I had terrible adult acne. My energy levels were, were low. So I started looking at dieting and counting calories and working out. And what I figured out was that trying those things was a great first step, but nothing worked for me. And so one day I looked at my diet soda can and saw that there were a lot of ingredients I didn't understand. And at that time, diet drinks were 10 calories. They hadn't perfected zero calories. So I decided to put it to the side just to do a test to see what would happen to me just by giving up my diet soda that I had been drinking for years. And when I did that, I was thirsty. So I started drinking water and I said, you know, water is great, but it's so darn boring. So let me slice up some fruit, throw it in the water two and a half weeks after doing this, I lost 24 pounds, my skin cleared up and my energy levels were back. You lost and I 24 thought, pounds in two weeks? Two and a half weeks. And Are I you thought- just drinking water? This is crazy. No, I was like not changing anything about my food or my exercise oh, at this point. Huh. I just had switched the drinks. And huh. I actually grew up in Arizona where I should have been drinking a lot more water, but somewhere I had sort of justified my diet soda thinking there's water in there somewhere, yeah. but not really thinking about the other stuff and what that was doing to my health. And so at that point, I sort of, People notice when you've changed that significantly in this short of time. Again, my whole network was tech executives and I uh, was taking a break at this point to be a mom and try and figure out what I wanted to do. You and I were talking about traveling. I was traveling 180,000 yeah. miles a year that year with AOL and I thought, I'm done. I'm gonna go back to San Francisco and live. But the thing for me after kind of thinking on this for about a year, I thought, you know, if there was just a drink that I could go to the local grocery store and buy that just had fruit in it, that didn't have sugar or diet sweeteners in it, I'd be set. Yeah. And I missed going to the store and buying that six or 12 pack of diet soda. And so I went to my local Whole Foods and I said, how do I get a product on the shelf? And again, I'm a customer. I'm not a beverage yeah. executive. And he said, well, I don't know. We have this program. This was at Whole Foods. They had this program that was for local companies. Yep. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to just go and just start a company, start a, start a, get a product on the shelf and see what would happen. I had no idea what I was getting into, but you know, at, at the beginning, you talked about beverage companies. My purpose and my mission was never 
to start a beverage company. The being a beverage company was a tool to health. And that's how I thought about it. And I thought if I can just get a product on the shelf, I could help other people drink water. Obviously the diet industry and the diet soda industry was so big. So if those people are looking for health and yet I had no idea, I knew I was starting a company and launching a product, but I had no idea that I was launching a new category. And you've interviewed tons of people. And I know you know this, that launching a category, the problem with that is that you're not only launching you know, a new company where you've got to explain and build a brand, but launching a category, you've got a ton of education, not only with the consumer, but also with the buyers that were gatekeepers for me to actually get it on the shelf. Yeah. And so there were so many things that I didn't know about it, but more than anything, my curiosity and my sort of interest in really being a lifelong learner, I, I was fascinated by this industry and, and how it really was the gatekeeper to health yeah. in me and so many people. Um, how did you, I mean, I think at the beginning, you actually kind of dipped into your own savings, right? I mean, you had left AOL and so, so, so maybe you had a little bit of a money there and you had, you self-financed it at the beginning, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, my, it was funny because a lot of, I'm living in, in, uh, the, in tech capital of the world and, and there were lots of people doing angel investments. And I, I remember saying to one person, they said, Hey, let me invest in, in what you're doing. It sounds really interesting. I said, don't do that. Actually, I want to still have dinner with you. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing right now. And so I talk about the first two years as getting my MBA and, and beverages and really trying to understand exactly how to do what I wanted to do. In addition to launching a product that didn't have sweeteners in it, I also wanted to launch a product that didn't have uh, preservatives in it. Right. And again, I kept asking people, so why do you need preservatives? And the, and the go-to for so many people was, you just do. And I thought, okay, but why? I came from the tech industry, just tell me, why, why do you need preservatives? And they said, well, if you're using real fruit, then you need preservatives in order to get a shelf life. And I said, okay, but why is that? And, and so 95% of the people that were bottling beverages said, listen, lady, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're asking, you know, questions that I don't know the answers to. I just do. And I, I said, okay. But then a few of them said, I don't know the answer. I'm really curious too. If you ever find that answer out, come back and, and let me know. And so we were the first beverage using real stuff to eat, to actually produce a product that didn't have preservatives in it as well. Kara, um, I want to ask you about the past year because obviously it's been a a, a I mean a very ch tr tricky year for, for mm -hmm. so many businesses. Just be, you know, forget about the economy for a moment, but just logistically, um, it's it's been surprisingly. Uh, I think many businesses have been su surprised or pleasantly surprised at actually how they did in 2020, with the exception, of course, of you know travel and restaurants and 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 you know many small mom and pop. Uh, businesses, but some businesses have done okay. Um, before we talk about how Hint did last year, um, tell me what I mean. As I mean, San Francisco, where you're based, because I think your your, your offices are mm -hmm. in the Marina District. I mean, San Francisco was the first city to shut down, to lock down in the United States. Um, in I think it was like March 17th of last year, because as you know, I'm in the Bay Area, and so I remember that. Um, what did you think at that time? I mean, were you thinking, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster for us. I was in New York a few days before that, and we actually shut down our office on March 12th uh, last year when we really saw our employees pretty concerned. We have an office in New York and Tribeca as well. And I remember flying back uh, on Friday the 13th and dropping into a Target store because I had started to see customer service uh, complaints saying you're out of stock in Target, yeah. which is a huge customer for us. So I stopped in as soon as I landed at SFO and saw that our shelves were empty. 
And I remember calling our head of sales and I said, there's no back stock. There's, you know, what do we do? And, and I went to the manager and I said, is there a, are you, are you reordering off of the register data? And the register data was actually showing that everything was fine. So that was the point that I really knew that we had an issue. And so the next morning I stopped at a few other target stores and I'm like, Houston, we have a problem. We have a huge problem. So we went out to our team and we said, my, my biggest pet peeve is saying we've got a problem and I don't want to be the recipient of, of, I would never want to be the recipient of we've got a problem. And instead we went out to all of our stores across the country and we said, Hey, can we send in a truck? If you guys are out of stock and something's not working with the software, I don't know what's going on, but can we just send a truck in? And like 70% of our customers said, sure. And I said, we'll figure out the invoicing later, but we were just, that was the weekend before all of the stuff was going on. And You know, I think for us, it was when San Francisco did shut down at that point, the difference between us and and some other businesses that are out there is that we're an essential product. And so being a water product and we're we're actually a little bit different than traditional. Uh oh. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, but I hear me too. Oh, it's so weird. Maybe maybe something on the back end there. Anybody anybody on our team have their um, their mic open? It's going. We're back and back and ready. <laughs> this is the still going. We're still on. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so anyway, Kara, you were saying, so you, I mean, how did you get the product to those stores? Well, we've, I think actually building a brand from scratch and, and having the ability to be scrappy, uh, yeah. you know, we just, we, we basically bypassed all of the way that we had been doing business and went back to our roots and said, let's just get the trucks in there. And we started reaching mm-hmm. out to uh, different trucking companies. The, the uh, interesting thing were, was that there were a lot of trucking companies that were actually having lots of issues because their customers were not using them. So we were able to find the trucks pretty quickly. But in addition, being a an essential product. So there are things that we have to do as an essential product that other companies don't have to do. We have to remain in stock right. as an essential product on the shelves. And so the good news is, is that we had planned on a pretty big year this year. We were going into large retailers like Walmart and Sam's Club and Aldi. And so we wanted to make sure that our production was really solid. We do right. everything in the U.S. We don't out. We don't. A lot of companies buy cans. A lot of the can suppliers are uh, or manufacturers are in China. We don't do any of that. We do everything locally. And so when all of this was hitting, the good news is, is that we had done a lot of work for the last four years to automate. So oh. our production lines, when we're actually filling the product, don't have people in the room. Right. So they are um, very, very automated. And so there were a lot of things that we did right along the way, obviously not knowing that it was going to be a pandemic, right. but it was uh, it definitely benefited us. And And finally, I think you know, the, the key difference talking about employees is that being a an essential product, while everybody was hearing that they should shelter in place and stay home, I was saying to our employees, here's your N95 mask that we have left over from the fires and your hand sanitizers yeah. and uh, and your gloves and you need to work. You need to get out there and work, which... I was not the most popular person on the planet. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, you wanted them to go back to the office? No, to merchandise, to get into Uh, stores uh, and and go and help. And so I I remember a couple of my employees reached out to me and said, and, you know, obviously pretty comfortable with me. They said, are you trying to kill me? 
Yeah. I mean, it was right. It was it was at a time when sure. they were being told. And and so I had never managed during a pandemic. I had never seen, you know, anything like this. And so what did I do? I put my Lululemon on and my hint jacket on and I went out to stores. And so I started, I went back to my roots of taking on a route in Marin County where I live. And I started to really look at what is the situation because if it really, really got scary in these stores, I didn't want my team to be in that situation. And so things, tiny little details like I went to a manager and I said, hey, I know you guys open at 7 a.m. Can I come here at 6.30? There's probably somebody flipping the lights on at 6.30. And he said, sure. So then I reached out to my team and I said, you can go at 6.30. Or I, I that's what the manager told me. You just need to ask. Hmm. And so just little things like that, I think, not only allowed us to do our job better, but also be supportive to grocery stores who were really having a challenging time and also help our team feel safe. How about now? I mean, um, are people coming back to your offices? Are, 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 are your employees working uh, at your headquarters again? So we are not officially back in the office. Um, probably we're you know still flexible, but it'll probably the earliest is fall at this point. But it was interesting because a few of our employees on both coasts reached out and said, hey, can we go back into the office? Because uh -huh. I think that the challenge is, is that so many people are either living alone or they're living with roommates, right? Or they don't have, you know, the right Wi-Fi or whatever it is. And, you know, we've, we've made it clear there's nobody really in the office, so you're not getting community. And, uh, but it's quiet. You can go in if you want. So we've kept them open. But, you know, Guy, we, we didn't furlough anybody during this time. We reallocated. You, you had mentioned Google, for example, one of our biggest customers. Right. And yeah. obviously, when Google offices closed, that business for us went away. It was about 15% of our overall business. Yeah. And so uh, with that, we said to our team, we don't want to lay anybody off, but we might have to reallocate your role and pretty much everybody was okay with that. We had a, a few people who just said it wasn't and they decided to leave. Uh, but in addition with that 15% of business that we knew we were gonna lose, uh, we already had a direct to consumer business right. that we started seven years ago. And so we said, how do we, what can we control right now? The direct to consumer business. So we threw the gas on the direct to consumer business. So that business you mentioned, uh, our overall business almost doubled. That business tripled for us since last March. And it really, uh, I think because we had it all in place and we were ready to go, that really made a difference. Kara, I want to switch gears because we're getting some questions and some some similar questions. So I'll try to kind of consolidate them um, from, from some viewers, uh, Kiva Joysher and Elizabeth Daly, about, uh, about the product and about plastic right because plastic is a very we've talked about this with other uh entrepreneurs on the show plastics cannot be recycled no matter what anybody says we know this they're they're not really recycled like actually planet money uh an npr program did a whole episode about this um and there's enough plastic on the earth forever and ever and ever um it doesn't go away so what options do you have i mean this is a product that you know, people need to buy and, and drink. I mean, there's glass, you know, there are, there are drinks that are sold in glass. It's very heavy. Um, and, and stores don't like it because they break glass breaks. But, um, I mean, are there, are there alternatives that you're looking at? Are there, are there things that you can do because water in a bottle or any beverage in, in plastic is a, it's a permanent piece of waste material. So what, what are, what are options that you have to try and tackle that? Yeah, so uh, it, it's an it's a very interesting topic, and I encourage everybody. We've done a lot of research on on this topic and packaging as a whole, especially for our size company. If you go to hintgreen.com, you'll see a lot of our research. So the go to is that plastic is bad. First of all, let me back up. We are not a 
uh, we are a beverage company and packaging is how we get the beverage out there, right? right? So we could produce our product in glass tomorrow, cans tomorrow, the paper boxes, whatever. We have actually chosen plastic hmm. and PET plastic, which is the most recycled plastic in the world. The biggest problem with plastic is that we are not encouraging the recycling centers and forcing the recycling centers in the US to turn those products into another product. So we are not doing what we could to create a full circle economy. And that is the biggest problem. So you see, for example, t-shirts or decks or fences that are made out of plastic. Yeah. We don't produce those things in the US. We don't do that. Instead, what you hear is plastic's bad. It was getting recycled and brought over to China and then China rejected it. Yeah. And then it ends up in the ocean. And that's partially true. But the reason why it was getting rejected from China is that we are not, in most cases, using PET plastic, which we are, and pure plastic. In many cases, you might see some beverage companies say up to a certain amount of the bottle is using plant-based materials right. or bamboo. So that actually screws up the recycling system because it is not pure. And so when we were trying, when the US was trying to ship plastic over to China, China was rejecting it because they're like, we have to separate it. It's very difficult to do that. Yeah. And by the way, when you take one of those bottles that has up to X percent other materials in it and you put it into the recycling system, it screws up the recycling system. And most consumers don't know where they should put these things. Glass, you mentioned, the problem with glass is not only is it heavy, so it takes, uh, we, we can ship less cases on a truck, so it takes more right. gas. It takes three times more energy to create a glass bottle than it does a plastic bottle. And then cans are getting shipped. I mentioned uh, this issue before, 99% of the cans are shipped from China. And there's this little trick in the industry that's been out there that is, uh, that is, has cans that are um, supposedly, they don't have BPA in them, um, but it's, it's called unintended. So you might see that on the back of a can. Right. Seems straightforward, but it's not straightforward. And so we've actually held off on, on using that product, but also aluminum in general, the carbon emission from aluminum is way worse from the, for the environment than plastic. So again, you'll see a lot of the stuff on Hint Green and it's a topic, obviously I'm very passionate about. I have four yeah. children. I want this world to be left a better place, but we, I think that the big, big issue that people need to be focusing on, and hopefully we will under the Biden administration, get a little more strict on this topic. We should be forcing states to take their plastic and produce something out of it. Um, a question from William uh, Tangora. William asks, do you have any advice for breaking into a space like beverages that is so saturated? What? How, how do you... How do you break into a space where there is where people assume their saturation and yeah. should you avoid that we actually have a whole episode about this very issue coming up on the show on monday but i'd love to hear your answer yeah i mean i think that the core thing that i share with entrepreneurs is you have to have an idea and you have to have a problem or, or you have to have a solution to that problem to fix it and then you have to start you have to start somewhere and I think that I view entrepreneurship as it's a puzzle, right? And I think it will really frustrate people if you need to have the picture and you need to know that there's an end point. So every single day, great entrepreneurs will tell you that the puzzle keeps changing, keeps adding on, right? It's, it's, 
constantly moving. Maybe people take puzzle pieces away from you and you don't exactly know yeah. when they're coming or if they're coming back, but you have to figure out how do you continue adding on? So I think it's just, it's a matter of trying and it's a matter of, of are you the person that really wants to dig in to a challenge and you know satisfy your curiosity and then i also think that you have to have the ability to build out a team or get a partner that knows how to build out a team i mean hint is not just me i have an incredible team behind me now of over 200 people that i would not be able to do what i do every yeah. day without them and i think that that's the missing piece you can have a great idea and a, a solution to that idea but if you cannot build out the team then it's not going to happen yeah Kara. before we go um what what is what is something that that you kind of have implemented over the past year that because of the pandemic that you want to kind of carry forward in into the the, the company or the culture of the company or or how you work um in into the future i think the the last year has really magnified for me this idea that we have to keep trying that there will always be a little bit of uncertainty there will always be uh hopefully not another pandemic but there will always be this uncertainty not really exactly sure what to do but you have to go and try and that is something that not having the experience when I started Hint, I actually think helped me and something I write about in my book that I just, you and I came out with our books about the same time. And, and uh, I loved your book, by the way, it was awesome. And, uh, but I, I think that that is so clear to me now that it's like, you don't need the experience. You don't need uh, the, you don't need to have all the I's dotted and T's crossed. You right. need to just go and try. And that's the key thing. I love it. Kara Golden, uh, founder and CEO of Hintwater, author of the book Undaunted. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Guy. Um, and thank you everybody for listening and for watching and being part of this. Um, a couple of quick announcements before, uh, before you sign off. We recently announced our 2021 How I Built This Fellowship. We're going to pick 10 up and coming entrepreneurs who are going to join us for um, uh, workshops and mentoring. And they're going to pitch their ideas to me and a panel of judges. And the winner, one winner, will receive. And they're all, also, we're going to put them on How I Built This, the platform on the shows, on this show, on, the, on our social media, and so on. One of those entrepreneurs will receive a $50,000 grant. Uh, supported by GoDaddy. Thank you for that support. We are going to hand them a $50,000, no strings attached, no equity grant to start their business. As the first time our show or NPR is doing anything like this, it's a year in the making and we're so excited about this. So please check it out. You can apply uh, at summit.npr.org slash fellows. Summit.npr.org slash fellows fellows. Everybody says you're supposed to give the URL twice. Um, you've got like six days before this closes. 30, March 31st, this, the deadline is, 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 is closed. So that, so you got six days to apply. Don't, don't miss this opportunity. It's a big opportunity. Um, also, we have another How I Built This Summit this year. Every year we do a summit, normally in San Francisco, where we have a thousand people come and can't do that together this year, but we're going to go virtual and actually our, we have an amazing lineup of speakers. I mean, uh, Brene Brown, uh, Rashad Robinson of Color of Change, Adam Grant, uh, amazing author. Gary V is going to be there. Uh, and then incredible, amazing entrepreneurs like Tristan Walker and Troy Carter. And I mean, on and on and on. Um, so come join us for the How I Built This Summit. It is a virtual summit this year. It's not very expensive to attend. It's gonna be four days of amazing conversations. There's networking sessions. There are gonna be all kinds of things for not only entrepreneurs, but anybody who wants to learn how to think more creatively or be inspired. So uh, you can find out more about that at summit.npr.org, summit.npr.org. So check it out uh, and we will see you back here next week. Kara, thank you again. It's great having you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.